Now, I've got a question as we jump in. How many of you have ever had a person in your life that just intimidated you? Just somebody that intimidated you. And okay, so and let me, let, let's, let's fine tune this then. How many of you had somebody in your life who intimidated you because they were just a jerk? They were mean. Anybody? Okay, yeah, yeah, you know, you know that. Well, uh, I, I, I remember between the ages of 13 and, and 15, I had a guy by the name of Tony. It's not Pastor Tony, but a guy uh, <laughs> by the name of Tony that, man, when I was a kid, man, he literally had it out for me and for three years just made my life miserable. But I learned something about a bully. Once you can find out who they really are, you can actually use that to your advantage. And today, as we jump into Revelation 12, I want us to look at uh, a bully, someone who has actually kept some of you guys in bondage and intimidation and fear for way too long. And it's time to reveal something about the bully because I want you to know that he doesn't have hold over your life thanks to what Christ has done. And so we jump in uh, you know, to Revelation 12 by first going to the end of Revelation 11. Revelation 11. This is the last trumpets being blown here. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And what's happening here is, is literally this is the end of, of, of judgment, sin, and, and sinners have been judged. This is going on for, it's gonna go on for eternity, Jesus reigns. But like I told you, and I've been telling you, Revelation isn't writ, written chronologically. And though Revelation 11 ends with this picture of God's temple and heaven being open, the Ark of His Covenant scene, which is just symbolic of He is present. He is, he is just on His throne forever and ever, where it's very clear that He is large and in charge. When we go to Revelation 12, we're jumping in a time machine and we're going back, 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 back. We're going back to when Christ was born, when we pick up our reading here in Revelation 12, and a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, and on his heads, seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And real, real quick, let me just give you a spoiler alert, okay? So you know who we're talking about. We're, we're, the dragon is referring to Satan. When Satan rebelled, kicked out of heaven, beginning of time, we, 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 he took out a whole third of the angels in heaven with him. The stars are uh, representative of angelic beings. But we keep reading, it says, and the dragon stood before this pregnant woman who's about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she, was, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Let me just pause here. We're gonna keep reading, so keep your Bibles open. You know, what's going on here? There's some people that think that, that, the, that the woman is Mary that's talking about the birth of Christ. And I would say that they're partially correct. I do believe this is talking about the birth of Christ. But as we're gonna see, the, the, the woman's actions and what she's going to do goes far beyond that of, of Mary. In fact, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down uh, Genesis 37 uh, verse nine. And, and you can look it up for yourself, but, but I always want you to double check. Don't, don't, don't always take my word for stuff, man. Go to the word, go to the word, go to the word. Genesis 37, nine. And this is where Joseph is, is giving, uh, he's having this vision, this, the, the younger brother, and he shows up to his brothers and, and he, he has this, this vision of, of the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. And, and in, in this vision, if you go back to Genesis 37, 9, the, the, the sun and the moon represent Jacob, his father, and, his, his, and, and the moon is his uh, mother. And then the stars represent the, the, uh, his brothers. So what I, what I think is, what we're gonna see here is this, this woman is representative of the nation of Israel. 
and, and from the nation of Israel is going to be born Jesus Christ. He's going to be born to rule all of the nations. In fact, if you go back another uh, chapter to write down Psalm 2, if you, it, it, talks, it talks about this, this ruler who is to come, who's going to rule with a rod of iron. It's very clear that it's talking about Jesus here. And so, so I just want to make sure that we, we have us figured out who are we talking about here. And so, so what we're going to see, though, this woman doesn't just represent the, uh, the, you know, the nation of Israel, but I, I believe that she's also representative of, of not just the old covenant community, but also the new covenant community. So the old covenant is the covenant that God made with, with his people, the Jews. Then we have the new covenant that is made with the blood of Christ. It's, it's written about in, in Hebrews. It's, it's a covenant with all of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And, and you're gonna see as we get into verses 11 th- through 17, why I think this is the case. But man, this is a very vivid picture of, of the dragon. She's getting ready to, to, to have a baby and he's just right there ready to catch the baby. I, I, let's be honest. How many of you in your nativity set have a red dragon? You know, is Will, I don't think Willow Tree is offering that as an option. Like when I was a kid, if I heard that there was a red dragon part of this, I'm like, I wanna be that in a live nativity until I found out it was Satan and they're like, no. But, but this is, this is a, a weird version of the Christmas story. And then what it, what it does is we, it gives us a new perspective. When Christ was born, what, what Satan wanted to do was to stop it at the very beginning. But what do we read? It's, it, man, she was... But the, uh, she gave birth and, and, and the child was caught up to God into his throne. This is speaking to the ascension. He couldn't touch Jesus. And so he tries to take after the, the lady, the, the woman, but she flees into the wilderness. She has this place uh, prepared by God. Well, then we keep reading in verse seven, it says, now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Now, Michael is an archangel. If you go back to the book of Daniel, he's mentioned there. He, he's the one when, when uh, the son of man, who I believe is referring to Christ, uh, to Jesus, even though he hasn't come, uh, the incarnation, he still appears. He fought with Jacob. He, he appeared to Abraham. He appeared to Joshua. He comes to Daniel in a vision. And when he comes to Daniel in a vision, it says that, that he was delayed in coming to Daniel because there was a war with the prince of Persia. It's a really interesting thing. And he said that the archangel Michael came to fight with him. And so Michael is represented. He's the representative archangel of the people of God. He fought with Jesus here, but it's interesting that what he did in Daniel 10, fighting with Jesus here, here we have him fighting for Christ in heaven. And it says, and the dragon and his angels fought back. We're seeing this this war here, but he was defeated. There was no longer any safe place for them, for the dragon and, and his angels in heaven. And I want you to miss what's happening here. Okay, this is very, very significant. Verse seven is describing It's this picture of the victory in heaven that happened with Christ's victory at the cross and resurrection. This is the coolest thing. So like if you read the book of Job, there are two storylines that are going through the book of Job. What's happening here on earth, the only thing that Job can see, and then the the other part of the story that's happening in heaven. What we have here and revealed in this vision that John's receiving is that while Christ was winning the victory here, there was a victory that was happening in heaven. There was the feet of the devil and his host by Michael and his angels. And look at verse nine. It says, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, Man, in the midst of all this craziness, look at this. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. Why? Because he knows that his time is short. And so like, if you're a video gamer, you're like, man, isn't this the opening sequence for World of Warcraft? I think this sounds like I've seen this before. No. What, what we're seeing here is the dragon being unmasked. And, and, and for the rest of the time that we have together today, 
I want to talk about this great dragon, the, the ancient serpent. Where have we heard that phrase before? The ancient serpent. Huh, where would that come from? Genesis chapter three. Why in the world would he be after uh, the the offspring? Well, it's because it was a curse given by God in Genesis 3.15 to this deceiver, this ancient serpent, that there was going, that the seed of of, of woman was going to bruise his head. In other words, that he was going to be destroyed by what was going to come from from Eve. He did not defeat God, God in the Garden of Eden. And the prophecy was given even then that he would be defeated. And he knows that this is gonna happen. That's why he's waiting to devour this child. And so I wanna talk about Satan, who he is, how he works. Last thing I can't wait to talk about is how he is conquered. So first thing is, let's jump in. Who is Satan? Like we got all these myths, you know, you know, the, the two horns, uh, the, you know, he's holding a pitchfork, has the, has the tail and all that sort of thing. I don't think that's it. Um, no, sometimes he appears as, a, as an angel of light. So he doesn't always show up the way you think that he's going to show up. But what we know is that, is that Satan is a high angelic creature who, before the cre- who even before you know, the creation of the human race, rebelled against the creator. He became the chief enemy against not just God, but literally against us. And, and, and you're like, well, man, in this day and age, do you really believe that there is a Satan? Do you really believe there's a God? Uh, what, what we're going to see is, is if we don't believe in the reality of, of, of Satan, we've got to come up with answers for things that don't make sense here. And scripture is very clear on breaking some of these things down for us. He's understood to be the prince of demons, fallen angels. They work for him. Uh, he wasn't just behind the fall of human race in Genesis chapter three. Uh, you know, we, we, we see that, that what was that curse that was given is, is fulfilled here. In fact, there's this interesting thing that Jesus said. He's telling his disciples what's to come, that he's going to be uh, crucified, that he's going to, to be resurrected. And as he's talking about dying in, in John 12, he says something interesting. John 12, 31, 32. You look this up if you wanna, if you wanna uh, research, double check me. John 12, 31 through 32. He said to his disciples, now, speaking of when he's crucified, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And so what he's saying is, well, he, he's gonna say, I'm gonna be lifted up. I'm gonna draw all men into myself. But he's making a point that now is the judgment of this world. The ruler of this world, he's speaking of Satan here, is going to be cast out. Cast out of where? Cast out of heaven. Now, here's the weird thing. Satan ha- has had prior to the cross, access to heaven. I'm like, oh, it's getting weird. What's going on? No, 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 this is scripture. We, do, we don't understand his role other than we know that he makes an appearance before God. There are times he appears before God. And, and when he shows up before God, as we're gonna see here in just a minute, he shows up with accusations, saying, hey man, have you checked out this person? Have you checked out that person? He, he shows up and then we're gonna, we're gonna see this. But what is happening here is, is this beautiful thing, this, this, these verses that we've read in Revelation 12, uh, you know, starting with verse seven through verse 12, and then what Jesus said here in, in John 12, it's, it's literally the turning point of human history because at the cross and at the resurrection represents this moment in history in which the power of the enemy in heaven was crushed and his kingdom came crashing down to earth, which is why he says, woe to the earth and the sea. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that a little bit more too. So what does Satan do here in Revelation 12? Well, if you look at verse 13, and we, if you, you know, as we keep reading, he pursues this woman. She's given wings of an eagle so that she can fly into the wilderness to be nourished. In fact, if you, if you read through the rest of chapter 12, there's a lot of analogy symbolism that we see here that come from the book of Exodus. If you read through Exodus specifically, uh, when, when God led the Israelites out of Egypt, delivered them, there's a lot of that same language. For instance, when uh, Moses... Uh, uh, I think it's Exodus 19, Exodus 19, and I think I put my notes, where is it? De- uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, Exodus 19, 4, Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 12. 
God uses this language. He speaks of rescuing Israel from Egypt and carrying, carrying her like an, like, like an eagle to the wilderness. Like, again, this is not the first time this language has showed up. In fact, as you're studying Revelation, before you just go off on some weird theory and like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it means, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles. Like, before you go down that road, take... Just literally go, go to, uh, go to blueletterbible.com or bible.com or man, even Google, just type in Bible verse and, and the phrase and see where else it shows up in the Old Testament. Cause you're gonna see a lot of these things are coming directly from the Old Testament. And so, so here in verses 13 through 16, the war is moving from heaven to war here on earth. The woman's given two wings of an eagle. Where have we seen a promise of, of uh, uh, the, the wings of an eagle being given? Remember, Isaiah uh, 40, 31, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall, they, sh they shall mount up with wings on eagles. Well, it actually happened right here, right here. And then we see the, the, rest, the rest of what takes place. Satan doesn't get to devour the child. He can't bring about the destruction of the woman. So what does he do? Look at verse 17. It says, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Hold on a second, who's the rest of her offspring? Guess what, believers? If you're here today and you're a Christian, that is you and me. Satan has declared war on, look at the rest of this, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So by the way, real quick, if you do not keep the commandments of God or hold to the testimony of Jesus, he's, right now he's not declaring war on you. He might have you, he's not declaring war on you. He's declaring war on those who are following Jesus Christ. And it says, and he stood on the sand of the sea and what we're seeing is Satan furious, he's making war on the church. So if I can't, if I can't take the child, if I can't, if I can't destroy the woman, I, I'm going after the people of God. I am declaring war. Just so everybody knows, if you're a Christian, you are at war. You might be unaware. That's a scary part of it if you're unaware. There, there is a war that's going on. It's what Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter six. We're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You think it's people. No, we're wrestling against principalities, against powers, rulers in high places. This is Satan de declaring war. Now, what are his methods for, for battling the people of God? First thing is this. He does this through kingdoms of this world. And this is where we jump into Revelation 13. I'll just summarize the first few verses here. Uh, Satan summons a beast out of the sea. And you're like, what is this, like Loch Ness Monster? Like, you know, bad Japanese horror movie? No, no. It, it, the sea in the book of Revelation, um, when it's talking about the earth, it, it's, it's, refer, it's a metaphor for the dwelling place of evil. And, and, and then this whole idea of a sea monster, it shows up in the Old Testament. Like if you read about uh, the sea creature, sea monster, Leviathan, uh, shows up in Job, uh, shows up in the prophets. Every single time this symbol of a sea monster is used in the Old Testament, 100% of the time it represents evil kingdoms, which are going to persecute God's people. Now, Here's the thing we gotta grasp. So John is having this vision. John is a real person living in a real period of, uh, in time. And you gotta understand the period of time that he's living in. First of all, John himself has, has recently been arrested and sentenced to death. They tried to kill him and it did not work. Literally, uh, Domitian, who was the, the emperor of Rome, tried to boil him alive and it didn't work. The reason he was sent to the, the island of Patmos where he's receiving this vision is because he freaked the mission out and he said, get him out of Rome, get him away, put him on this island. Cause it, like he, like there's some weird voodoo magic going on here. Well, it wasn't voodoo magic, it's literally the power of God. And, and God even used this to, to send a message to the church. But as John is having this vision, it's not like he, like us, we're, we're thinking ahead. We're like, man, who's it gonna be? When's it gonna come? What's it gonna look like? John's, John's like, oh no, I, yeah, like, I get what he's talking about. You see, there's, there's an already and a not yet aspect to these visions here. 
because Rome was very large and in charge. In fact, as we look at, you know, look at verse three and verse five in chapter 13, it talks about the blasphemous uh, phrases written on the horns. Man, the, the rulers of the Roman empire, beginning with Caesar Augustus, he was the first one that allowed people to call him a deity. He was the first one to allow people to worship him. And, and then it went beyond him just allowing that to happen to Nero and, and, and then Domitian. They literally put their face on coins. They called themselves gods. In fact, Domitian called himself the king of kings and lord of lords. Does that sound familiar? It's blasphemy. He was saying, I am God. In fact, uh, Domitian, there, there was a period of time during his reign where the only currency you could use in the Roman Empire had his face on it. And there was a, there was a phrase on there that, re that uh, referred to him as king of kings and lord of lords. Literally the mark of the beast. And so when John hears, when, he, when John sees this vision, he's thinking, this is what we're facing right now. And, and, and the beast that he sees, the beast that we see described here in, in, in uh, Revelation 13, it, it has precedence. If you go back to, if you go all the way back to Daniel 7, you see, you see this. And there, in Daniel's vision, it was talking about, you know, the kingdoms of Babylon, Greece, Persia, uh, Rome. But then, you know, uh, John's seeing it in a different context, in his historical context. We, as we await the return of Christ, it, it has a, a context for us. What, what we've seen though, is that there are kingdoms of this world that have persecuted the church, that have been after Christians, that when you look at the evil that is perpetrated, there is something behind them. They are pawns of evil. It didn't stop with Nero. It didn't stop with Domitian. It didn't stop with Attila the Hun. There's, there's Hitler and the atrocities that, that he did. We have uh, Stalin. We have what took place in, in Romania, what literally is happening today in countries around the world. I think of North Korea, what, what is happening is, as literally hundreds of thousands of, of people are just being slaughtered or being imprisoned, persecuted, Verse seven of chapter 13 says that the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Now I want, I want you to write down the second method that, that uh, is used. He didn't just use the kingdoms of this world as part of this. Satan uses deception. He makes war on the church through deception. It's very interesting if you compare what is written about the beast and what is written about Christ, how similar they are. I'll just give you a few of these. Both of them were slain and are risen to new life. Chapter five, uh, verse six, talking about Christ. Chapter 13, verse three, talking about the beast. Both have followers with their names written on their foreheads. Both have horns. Both have authority over every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Both receive worldwide worship. Both have a final coming or manifestation, though one is gonna to be to destruction, the other is to eternal glory. The reality is this, one of Satan's greatest methods of making war on the church is not just overt attack, it's subversive attack through deception. Yeah, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you fair warning before we go into 2024, okay? So Jesus, Terry, we're going to 2024 and it's gonna be an election year. And I'm gonna call out, I'm going to call out what I saw in 2020 and disappointed me and I didn't say enough about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it out in 2024. For those people who buy into this lie that it's the kingdoms of this world that are gonna deliver hope, peace, and prosperity and whatever else. I'm gonna call it out. If I, if, I, if I start seeing the church getting caught up, grace, I'm gonna talk, I, I'm not pastoring all the churches here in town. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just deal with the flock that God has given me the opportunity to lead. If I see us getting caught up in this whole thing of, you know, whether, you know, maybe it's a, gonna be Trump or Biden. The weird thing is we can have two candidates that are both in prison when we go to, you know, go to the polls, like oh, what's going on here? 
But dude, like, like if, we get, if we get in this whole thing and we're just demonizing other people because they don't see things, we're just, we're, we're just, we are literally losing our witness because we're putting faith in this world and the kingdoms of this world. I'm gonna call out the crap for what it is. I'm not gonna hold back. And so just, just right now, like if you guys are, are just easily offended and you're like, I want Keith to, to support my candidate, to get up on the platform and say, vote for my candidate. I'm not gonna do it. I don't care how many emails and memes, don't even send me the memes, the emails, the videos. Okay, just, seriously, you're wasting your time. I'm not gonna go there. Now, is it important that we vote? Yes. Is it important that we're Christian citizens? Yes. Is it important that we get involved? Yes. I'd love to have somebody to vote for that I believe in. But at the end of the day, can I tell you, it's not gonna be the kingdoms of this world that bring about the purposes of God. Our hope is not in the White House. Our hope is in who's sitting on the throne. That's what matters. That's what matters. And, and, and so, so listen, I, what, the reason I'm gonna do this is not just so, you know, I, I can get clicks. I'm gonna do this because one of Satan's greatest tools in the church is by joining the church, mm-hmm. by showing up, by, by getting us consumed with things that have absolutely nothing to do, have nothing to do with the purposes of God. He has, he's called right here, he's called the deceiver. He's been, he's been called the deceiver from the very beginning. What, what are his very first words recorded in scripture? Has God really said? That's literally where it starts. Has God really said? Is your hope really in God? Is your, has God, man, like I, right now, the sad thing is there are churches and seminaries, so-called Christian colleges that have gone to this place. God didn't really mean that. You can't trust the whole Bible. You can only trust the part of scripture that has to do with salvation. You gotta throw out the rest of scripture. He's a deceiver. Somebody recently called me a fundamentalist, which I was like, what? What do you mean by that? And they were being sarcastic. And because I always thought of fundamentalists was, you know, the independent fundamental King James Version, 1911 or 1611, read a letter version of Jesus words, Bible, that kind of thumping type of person. I'm like, well, I'm not that person. They're like, no, no, no. We mean that you actually, you actually believe the Bible's true. I'm like, I don't know any other kind of Christian. Honestly, I like, if that, if it's not true, what are we doing here? Like, I, I'd much rather be watching football right now. If that's not true, if it's a lie, let's get out of here. Go to Wendy's and come on. I just lost some of you. Like, you're like, I want to go to Wendy's, man. <laughs> no, li- literally, man, he, he's, he's using deception. But, but not only that, what, what, what Satan's always done is he's, he's attacked the church through accusation. Here in chapter 12, verse 10, he's referred to as the accuser who accuses the saints day and night before God. Man, what we see in Job, man, he, he showed up and what did he do? He, said, he told God, he's like, man, the only reason Job is doing what he's doing is because you're taking it easy on him. He won't do this. He accused Job. Then when, man, when Job was suffering, he came back and accused him again. If you go to, uh, if you go to Zechariah chapter three, we, we see him uh, attacking Joshua, a high priest there. He's accusing him. This is who he he is. He doesn't just accuse in the Old Testament. Listen, he's accusing some of you today. And what he accuses is your hope that you have that Christ is enough. Because if he can get rid of your hope, he'll take away your faith because faith is synonymous with hope. May he destroy your faith. That's what he wants to do. And some of you have been listening to the voice of the enemy because you can't figure out the difference between God's voice and the enemy's voice. And church, listen, I don't know what to do. It's not enough for us to say, well, I'm gonna legalistically read the Bible every day. I'm gonna read, you know, an hour. Dude, stop taking a legalistic approach. The reason we have the word of God is first of all, it reveals who God is, but it also reveals how he speaks. When I talk to my kids, they know my voice. My kids can pick out my voice. When I'm, when I'm yelling at them in a, in a room full of, of other voices, they hear me because they know me. There are times we don't know his voice. And so what we do is when the accuser starts speaking and he's, he, man, he's been talking to a lot of you. He said that, man, you don't have value. He's, he's told you, he's told you that that sin you committed, it's fatal. You can never be forgiven because of what you did. That character flaw that you possess, that's gonna define you for the rest of your life. He's telling you that you can't move forward. He's telling you that your marriage is over. So why don't you just walk away and just enjoy, just live life up? Because it's over anyway. 
He's telling you your kids are too far gone. They're never coming back. He's telling you that the addiction is going to own you. He is trying to do everything he can to defeat you. He's saying that addiction is too strong. The sin is too, too big. You're way too far gone. He is accusing, but listen to me, church. He is a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's accusing you and you have thought that it's God, but it's not. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, both Satan and God will point out our sins, but the proposed next steps are wildly different. They are, they're wildly different. Satan accuses and condemns. God calls out and redeems, big difference. You know what Satan does? He, he starts with what you did and he tears down who you are. What does God do? He starts with who he has remade you to be in Christ and he rebuilds on what you did. Massive difference. We have an accuser. We have an accuser. And you've got to learn the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the accuser. But I, as, as we come to close, I just want to just leave you with this. There are two things, two things that Satan does not want us to know. So I'm very thankful for revelation. Two things Satan does not want us to know. Number one, he doesn't want you to know that he's already doomed. He doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to know that what took place on the cross and the resurrection, that he literally lost what, what, what power he had in heaven. He was kicked out. Like literally the end started then. The end started then. He doesn't want you to know that he is doomed. He doesn't want you to know that though he's an accuser, we now through Christ have an advocate. He doesn't want you to know what, what is written in 1 John chapter two, where it says, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if any one of you does sin, what we can know is that now, now we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, which means that literally he took the wrath intended for us. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, for, for the sins of the whole world. Satan's accusations are limited by Christ's advocacy. And he does not want to know that when he's yelling in your ear, that Satan is right up there to God advocating for you, advocating for me and saying, we're not gonna give up, right God? We're not gonna give up. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to know that his powers have been curtailed. He doesn't want you to know that he's not as powerful as he wants you to think he is. He is doomed. He's due. It's already started. He knows it. And so he is just furious. He's making war, but he's doomed. The second thing that he doesn't want you to know is this. He doesn't want you to know that he can be overcome. He doesn't want you to know that he can be overcome. And I want every single person that is a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been saved, but yet you struggle with sin or you struggle with shame or you struggle with doubt. You, you just, you, you've heard the accusation for far too long and it's just, it, you want to believe that, that God is for you. You want to believe that yes, you're totally forgiven. You want to believe that God can use you, but because of the doubts, because of the accusation, you just, you just have some fear. I wanna give you three ways from scripture in which we overcome, three ways in which we overcome the enemy of our soul, Satan. Number one, you overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb. This is at the heart of it all. The saints anchored their confidence to the blood of the lamb. Jesus died for us. And there are two things that are revealed in Christ dying for you and me. First of all, it means that you have immense value. You have immense value. You were worth dying for. Secondly, because Christ died, anything that you could imagine would be an obstacle that could separate you from God, he has forever removed. And I'm gonna make a bold statement here. And, and listen, if you are doubting I want you to grab this like a drowning person grabs a lifeline. Listen to this. If you grasp, and I mean you really grasp the gospel, you can overcome every spiritual attack that Satan throws at you. Everything. 
Now listen, are there medical things we go through? Is there clinical depression? Are there, are there things that, 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 absolutely. But what I'm talking about is there are things that we are treating with drugs that should be treated with the gospel. For instance, if you feel like, man, nobody likes me, man, I have no value, man, my, you know, everything I touch falls apart, man, I, I feel like, I feel like, man, my future is nothing more than hopelessness, more pain, and, and I've got to medicate myself with, with alcohol, drugs, prescription pills, or these messed up fantasies, you know, I'm going to escape with this. Man, th there's one or two things, one, one or two things that might be true about you. Number one, I, I'm, I'm going to start here. Maybe you've never really put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been a professional Christian in the sense that you've made a profession, but, you, but you've never had faith. You've signed a card, you prayed a prayer, but it, but it was just, it was a form. It was nothing more than that. It wasn't faith that what Christ did on the cross was enough. Listen to me, man, you gotta grab the gospel. This is, this is it, you turn to Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian, but you know, you, you have no idea how much God loves you. You don't know the plans that he has for you to give you a future and a hope to make you into something beautiful, to really use you even in your pain or, or that what he has in eternity is actually going to actually heal the brokenness of this life. Maybe it's just, you don't know. Listen, we go back to the gospel. Maybe it's just that, You've heard the gospel. You show, you've, been, you've been to church ever since you were a little kid, but you haven't let the weight of the gospel sink in. You've never given it enough weight in your life. You know it intellectually, but, 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 but it's, it's almost like God's feelings about you don't matter so much or somebody else that matters more. It's kind of like when I'm watching America's Got Talent. Every single person comes out, the only person they're worried about is Simon Cowell. Literally, what Simon think? What Simon think? What Simon think? Did you know what's funny? I, I bet all of us have a Simon in our life. You have a Simon in your life. You're trying to perform and you're trying to, you're trying to tell your dad that you're worth it. You're trying to tell your spouse that, that those mistakes, that, that you're, you're getting past that. You're trying to tell your kids that you're sorry for the, for the stupidity you did as a parent. Like there, there, there are a lot of other voices and other people that we're listening to, but man, we've got to listen to what God says. We got to listen to what the gospel says. And so if you're struggling with guilt as a Christian, either you don't understand what Christ has done for you, that he's taken your sin and he's put it away from you as far as the East is from the West and remade you into a new creation in Christ, or you just don't value God's opinion of you enough. I've had a lot of people say, well, I believe that God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. I just want to pause, man. I don't want to like, I, I get regret, shame, where, where like we struggle with what we've done. I get that. But hold on, can we just listen to what we're saying when we say that? Yeah, God, I, I know what you say, but I can't forgive myself. Hold on a second. Are your standards really higher than God's standards? See, like, I'm not trying to be sarcastic or anything because I've heard that. I've heard people say that a lot. Hold on though. Do you need your forgiveness? No. You need the, man, who you've sinned against. You didn't sin against yourself alone. You didn't sin against somebody. Else. You sinned against him. His forgiveness is enough. Man, we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb, my faith is in what Christ did, period. What I did, man, I wanna follow Jesus, but it's what Jesus did that matters first and foremost. But not only that, you and I overcome by the word of our testimony. You know why Satan's accusations carry so much weight? Because they're partially true. Because Satan tells the truth when he brings up what you did. And the reason why you listen to the accuser is because you know what he brings up from your past is true. You know you did that. You know you were that. You know what is in your past. But where he deceives and where the truth turns into a lie is when he infers that because we did this, this is who we are. 
The way we shut up the accuser is with the word of our testimony and we declare not only to ourselves, but to anyone else who listens, this is who I was, this is not who I am. And what has made the difference is Jesus Christ. He made the difference. Now, listen, there are a lot of us that will write in our journal things that we would never say out loud. And I get that to a degree. There are some people who overshare and there's some things, some details that we don't need to glorify Satan. However, on the other hand, there are way too many of us that have limited our testimonies to what we have internally or to the pages of a journal. And that's not how we overcome. We overcome by the proclaimed word of our testimony. Now, let me just tell you what this looks like. It's nothing, a testimony is not you getting up and preaching. A testimony is you taking advantage of the opportunity that God gives to say, man, this is who I was before Christ. This is who I was, but this is what Christ did. And this is who I am today. Man, I never forget when I was, when I was raised in a church, I was raised, I knew all the language. And I, I'll never forget at the age of 13, I was on my paper route and I came across pornographic magazine that somebody had discarded. And literally what I saw scarred my, my brain as a 13 year old. And what happened was that started me on this journey of what, man, what is this? And, and this, this, this carnal curiosity took over and literally pornography ruled my life from the age of 13 all the way through my time as a student at Indiana University. I went to Bible college. I mean, if you go to Bible college, surely nothing happens there, right? I mean, this is all Christians. Are you kidding me? It was my senior year of college, Christian college. Or man, I was driving around and I was so sick and tired of living this lie, but sick and tired of being enslaved. And dude, I'll never forget in March of 1999, where for the first time God opened my eyes that it wasn't me making all these resolutions, me joining enough accountability groups. I literally, like I either am gonna trust God with this or I, I guess I'm just gonna carry this. And I just, I told God, I was like, I'm not faking it anymore. I'm letting go. Either you can save me or you can't. Now, here's what I wanna tell you. From that time forward, God set me free instantly. Now listen, he doesn't always do it that way. Okay, so like, don't say, well, well man, I guess there's something wrong with me because God didn't deliver. No, I, some, sometimes he delivers instantly. Sometimes, man, it's, a, it's, it's this process in which he is refining and, and doing this work. But here's what he did for me. He delivered me instantly. Since 1999, man, I can say with a clear conscience, man, I did not go back to who I was. And it's because of God. I don't get the glory. God gets the glory for that. Temptation is real. Temptation comes. He gets the glory. But here, here's the deal. I went into ministry shortly after that. And when I went into ministry, man, I, I, I knew that I was forgiven. I knew what God had done. I knew that he had forgiven me. But man, I, I had this compartment in my life that I, that I just closed off. My testimony of being delivered, oh man, I don't want to get that out because I mean, what are people going to think? Like, oh man, we don't want that guy as a pastor, creep, pervert, like get out, get him fired. No, like, like this is a little weird period. You, you put that away. And so you know you forget, you live in forgiveness. You live in deliverance. But here's the deal, you don't live in freedom. You know why you don't live in freedom? Because you're not sharing your testimony. And I remember in 2006, seven years after God had forgiven me and, and, and uh, set me free from the hold of this, he broke the chains. And man, I, I was praying and God said, man, I want you to come clean. I just, I, you gotta share what I've done for you. And I, I argued with God. In fact, I, I, I made God deals. I prayed more. I read the Bible more as a better husband. I was just all oh, doing great things. And God just, he wasn't impressed. He's like, no, here's what I want you to do. And finally, I called a guy who's a mentor in my life. He'd been president of the college I attended. Some of you know Mike Avery. And I said, man, I said, I've never shared this, but here's how I was living while I was at college. And I said, God's forgiven me. But man, I just feel like I just gotta, I gotta come clean. This has been in my past. Man, I, I, man I, I, just, I just want to come clean. And I don't remember how the conversation went. I, I just, I know that when I hung up, I wasn't just forgiven, I was free. 
Satan had been conquered, not just through the forgiveness, Satan had been conquered through the word of a testimony. Here's who I was, here's what I did, here's what Christ did, and here's who I am today. And since that time, God's given me the opportunity to literally to share my story all over the United States. I've shared in other countries. I've shared with teenagers. I've shared with college students. I've shared with guys who have been given up. Their, their, their wives are kicking them in the tail saying, you're a loser, get out of here. I've been able to share that your addiction isn't the end of the story. Satan doesn't get to define you. You can be forgiven and you can be free, but the way you're gonna conquer is by the word of your testimony. But here's our problem. Man, we're scared to death to share a testimony. In fact, listen, sometimes it's, it's spouses that don't want us to share our testimonies. I'm getting the amens there. Um, but uh, <laughs> the reality is this, man. We conquer by the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony, the proclamation that gives glory. We don't glorify sin, we glorify God. And glorify what he's done in our lives. And then the third thing is by a faith, a bold, courageous faith that says, if death is the worst that Satan can bring my way, it is what it is. I am not going to stop. I'm not gonna shut up because I know that Satan is doomed. I know that Satan has already been defeated. I know how the story ends and I'm going to live regardless of what I see. That's how we conquer. Satan wants you to think that he owns you. He wants you to, he wants you to think that, that your past, that your past, you're never gonna get past your past. Listen to me, because of Christ and what he did on the cross and by the great power that he has given you and I in a testimony as we publicly declare, here's who I was, here's what Christ did and here's how he's changed me. We can conquer the enemy. Amen. We're gonna walk out of here, child of God, in victory, not because we hope that it's so, we're gonna walk out in victory because it is so. Our victory is in Jesus Christ. The battle has already been won. And so God, as we leave here today, I pray that we would not leave hanging our heads because of who we've been, where we've been, what we did, who we think we are, but that we'd leave knowing that you are for us, that you are with us, Christ, that you are advocating before the Father for, for us. So God, instead of being intimidated by the bully of all bullies, may we understand that as he is unmasked here in Revelation, we see the truth about who he is, how he operates, but we also see the truth about his destiny. He's already been defeated. He's going to be doomed to eternal torment, and we can't wait for that day. But until then, we don't have to live in bondage. We can live in freedom, and we can and overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony with a bold and courageous faith. May we walk out of here sharing what needs to be shared. May we say what needs to be said. May we trust in, in what Christ has done, the, the, the trust that we need to have. And God, for the victory that you're gonna provide your church, we say thank you for this. And I can't wait till the day that we get to see the final victory once and for all. And for what you're going to do until that day comes, we say thank you. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said... Amen. Leave as victors, because you are.